morning and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for being here and listening in. I've been co-chairing the City of Edmonton's Winter City Strategy for the past five plus years. And one of the big focuses we've had as a Winter City is um, for too long we simply uh, gave a cursory kind of attention to wintertime, even though it was our longest season, and we simply kind of hibernated far too much, and we didn't embrace winter life uh, and winter city design, and we didn't do things like embrace winter festivals adequately. Um, and so what we've tried to do is have a grassroots movement to get a lot of Edmontonians involved in thinking about winter in their city. One of the things that Edmonton's tried to do is Think of, think of everything as it relates to winter. Our bylaws, our policies in the city of Edmonton, how we actually encourage uh, further business in wintertime. So for example, when you're working with people in terms of commercial environments, for example, as it relates to TOD, one of the key things is to ask, have you done a performa based on eight months or based on 12 months. If you're not thinking adequately adequately about winter, you should really do a performer really for eight months of activity and, and because if you're not thinking about winter, then you really can't be truly thinking about uh, a 12 month performance. The City of Edmonton recently just adopted winter city design guidelines and these are available for you to downline and crib and borrow and, and please uh, please use them as you see fit. There's a lot of really good ideas that we kind of worked on in-house. I'm not going to say that we didn't certainly do a lot of extensive research throughout North America, throughout Northern Europe. We did trips to Northern Europe and we talked to a lot of people there. Uh, we even talked to uh, jurisdictions as far as away as Sapporo, Japan and Mongolia uh, and Iceland to get input as well. So we had a really wide cross-section of best practices and we kind of took them and we tried to make them uh, native to Edmonton. So if you go to the City of Edmonton website for Winter City, you'll find videos on here, you'll find all kinds of information that's really trying hard to make Edmonton uh, a lot more Winter City centric. Santic as a company has worked on Winter City design both in terms of how we think about architecture, how we think about things like freezeways or iceways, uh, how we think about the, the built form so it's more comfortable. Part of winter city thinking is really trying to have a huge shift in terms of the culture. For too long we've had an attitude which was we kind of, like I said, kind of rejected it, hibernated, and what we often did was we said, well, what's the closest I can get my car to the door by which I'm going to go in, and what's the least amount of clothing I can wear based on that distance I'm going to have to walk from where I park and where I go in. And so we really kind of, as opposed to dressing to be outside uh, for longer periods of time, we kind of dress grossly inadequately. So there's, there's a whole mentality change about how we dress for winter, how we build our cities for winter. And many cities obviously do a really poor job thinking about winter. When they think about winter, they simply think it's all about snow, uh, what's your snow clearing policy in terms of the plows and how many inches of snow should they be leave on the ground and the cost of snow clearing and they give it really a, a really pathetic uh, a, attempt at kind of tackling winter. But when you think of Minnesota and you think of Canada and you think of many parts of North America that have one of their longest seasons and most present seasons is winter, it's so incumbent on us to really kind of embrace it differently. So winter, winter design in a nutshell is really comes down to five key things. Blocking out the wind because it could be uh, just a little bit below freezing uh, or quite a bit below freezing, but if there's no wind and the sun is on your face, it can feel really comfortable to be outside. But if it's below, if it's below freezing and there is a wind and you're in the shade, it feels horrible and it's so uncomfortable to be a pedestrian. And you cannot think about transit-oriented development if you can't think about pedestrians because every transit trip begins and ends as a pedestrian. So you cannot become a successful TOD if it is not a successful four season pedestrian environment, which is so important. And why, I, why, my opinion, why so many TODs in northern climates fail, because we don't adequately address all four seasons in terms of design. The other key aspect is about capturing sunshine and putting people in it, using color, because too often we embrace, we embrace colors that actually make us feel colder 
and darker and, and don't feel uh, warm to us. Embracing lighting and thinking about infrastructure differently. And so part of this starts at the neighborhood level. We know that in most places, uh, like Minnesota, the worst wind comes from the north and the northwest. So if we can do neighborhood design and you think about brand new suburban TUDs, if you can, when you have to do the grading of the land and you uh, build up, uh, you build up the grades um, for storm ponds and for other things, as much as we can, we need to kind of pile the snow in the north to northwest part of these sites. We need to put coniferous trees on those embankments because those kind of mitigate the wind in a big deal. Part of it also means thinking about the street layout differently. Curvilinear streets are not TOD friendly and they're not winter city friendly. In winter times, we want to make sure that people can be comfortable walking outside, but we don't have an environment in winter time where we want to unduly add two minutes or five minutes or ten minutes to somebody's walk uh, because we have a curvilinear design. We need shorter grid environments so it's much more convenient, intuitive, and comfortable to walk a shorter distance. Part of this is very much about blocking wind, and there's all kinds of different vehicles that can be used in terms of the urban design to block wind, but it's critical. You can use setbacks, you can use uh, colonnades, uh, you can use uh, uh, canvas canopies to kind of redirect the wind away from pedestrians. You, have, you can also use landscaping, and landscaping is a great vehicle, but it has to mean either taller uh, bushes and windrows, you have to think about coniferous trees and things like that that are really going to help mute the wind a little bit and kind of take out some of the velocity. The Aqua Tower in Chicago is an 80 plus story tower, and if you've been at the base of it, surprisingly, even though it's adjacent to Lake Michigan, it's really not that windy at the base of the building. And so the, the, design of the, uh, the design of the building took in mind how the wind, it modeled the wind very successfully. So as the wind hits the building and it kind of goes down, it's shaped in such a way that it really successfully uh, takes out, diffuses the energy in the wind so that as a pedestrian at ground level, you really don't feel windy. In fact, the wind you're feeling at ground level, if there's any, is from other buildings that have done a, a miserable job about blocking out the wind. Whereas the Aqua Tower, which is the, uh, by the way, the, I believe it's still the tallest building in the world designed by a female architect, uh, did a brilliant job of modeling out uh, and designing out the wind. A lot of this is also about capturing sun, sunshine and putting people in sunlight as much as possible. So that means thinking about sun traps and also thinking about the shape of the streets. So when we're doing the laying out TUDs and we're laying out uh, development, what are the opportunities so that we can actually turn the streets so that every side of the street is going to get some amount of sun in winter time? And we have to think very hard about the modeling of winter. Too often when we're doing sunlight shadow studies, we're usually doing them from the equinox to equinox, and we're almost writing off winter saying, well, it's, you know, it doesn't get that high of the horizon, and, and so it's really tough to avoid um, uh, sunlight shadow impacts in winter time. Well, that's not adequate thinking. I think we have to really think about how we put as much sun as possible into the public realm and do four season uh, modeling of sunlight shadow studies. That also means that we need to start thinking about the location of taller buildings, that we have to have a lot of care and attention because the cumulative effects of multiple buildings in close order can really mean that an area for four months of the year, year can be effectively in darkness and perpetuity. And that, to me, is hostile towards creating a successful pedestrian environment, hostile towards encouraging more retail and commercial activity, and which is what we really want, which is a lot of local business uh, development. Microclimates are also really critical, and this means thinking about, um, again, maximizing the sun in every way possible. So locating the trees uh, in a way that so that they're on the north side, they're kind of on the north side of uh, walkways, uh, again, building on sun traps, and using color. It shocks me sometimes when I see how much architects who are disproportionately male um, do not adequately think about warmth and how do we create really charming and warm environments. In wintertime, that's so important. So we see a lot of gray and a lot of steel, a lot of glass, 
And to me, those are things that accentuate the cold as opposed to do the opposite. So we need to use more wood as building materials, embrace color, and have some fun with it. We also need to use creative lighting. We've got wonderful palette of darkness for almost six months of the year. And we, and we know in Minnesota, as, is, as in most places, there's a lot of boring, drab architecture that's just begging for some creative lighting to be displayed on the side of the building. We can do that. We can embrace lighting. We can embrace our public parks and use landscape lighting to do, add interest to our public parks. We can think about nightscaping for everything from our public art to how we add interest to buildings. So it can be very obvious stuff like architectural lighting on a heritage building that lights up a cornice and different details and moldings. However, uh, it's really about thinking about what are all the opportunities where there's a blank facade where we can embrace nightscaping, which is architectural landscape lighting. The use of light is so critical when we think about the opportunities for TUD. How do we make these places safer, more interesting? So as we're walking as a pedestrian in a TUD environment, how do we make these places feel a lot more interesting to us? And safety is a real big part of it. If we can get more people walking around in a TUD, then they're going to feel a lot more safe. And there's such wonderful opportunities with their palette of darkness this month of the year. And so one of the big things is also heritage buildings. I, I spoke about this really quickly, but if there, if there is any typology of building that begs for architectural lighting, it is uh, heritage buildings. And there's such great opportunities because they just so well lend themselves towards lighting, and that can dramatically enhance the sense of place. Infrastructure is also very important, and this means things like infrastructure around winter cycling. And just quickly, the story of Copenhagen. So Copenhagen, in 1970, came very close to banning bikes in Copenhagen. So I think it was about 1970-71, the city council in Copenhagen was so worried about traffic flow through the city center that they came very close to voting to ban bikes through Copenhagen because they wanted to increase the capacity of the roads and bikes were taking away from capacity for cars. Thankfully, they voted the right way and the progressive way, and they made the decision that they really wanted to double down on bikes. So starting in the 1970s, they started thinking about building protective bike lanes. In some years, they had a little bit of money and they just built a mile or two of protective bike lanes. Some years when they had more money in their city budget, they added, they added tens of miles of bike lanes. The cumulative effects is that a generation later, they've got 400 miles of protective bike lanes in and around Copenhagen. And they passed a very important milestone a couple of years ago, I think it was about two years ago, where 50% of all trips through Copenhagen are done by bike. That doesn't include pedestrians or transit. 50% of all trips are done through bike in a place that was so auto-centric in the early 70s that, si that City Hall nearly voted to ban bikes. And so the point here is about relentless progress, having a bold vision uh, to transform an area, but you cannot achieve that kind of transformation if you don't think about uh, change in winter in the Copenhagen. That means, and these images, by the way, are from Copenhagen. People ride bikes in Copenhagen even when it looks like this. Copenhagen is a city that gets 20 average days a month of either rain, snow, or sleet. 20 days a month, year-round, they average rain, snow, or sleet. And despite that miserable weather, they also get 50% of all trips by bike, which is phenomenal. That means thinking about how do we kind of have conversations about bikes, how do we provide protective bike lanes. In a winter city context, it is not adequate to simply put down a strip of paint. We need to have proper protective bike lanes because there's too much grit on the roads, too much salt on the roads, and we need to have further barriers that apply that 880 principle so that whether you're 80 years old or 8 years old, you feel comfortable cycling on a road next to a bus. But you need to have some kind of barrier that's going to separate you from that bus and from that vehicle. Otherwise, you're not going to feel safe, especially in a winter context when you know a bike or vehicle can slip. That's why you cannot have a successful winter cycling city if you don't think about protection for, uh, in wintertime. 
This also means about bicycle storage and making sure that that's comfortable and, and intuitive and available. Bicycle routes and storage are critical. And also thinking about the infrastructure in, around with our frequent changes in weather where we get these schizophrenic uh, uh, environments where one week it's 50 degrees and the next week it's zero degrees. And when you get those swings, you get these freeze-thaw cycles. And so we constantly get pooling of water happening at intersections. And when we realize that, uh, depending on the community, anywhere from one-third to one-quarter of our populations by the 2030s are going to be senior citizens, that means we must be planning today for a society with reduced mobility. And you cannot have successful winter cities if we don't start thinking about how infrastructure performs, not just in summer when we have a storm, but in spring thaw, spring thaw, thaw cycles, so that it's very comfortable to cross streets. You think about somebody who's in a wheelchair or uses a walker like my 84-year-old dad, and these barriers to walking around as a pedestrian are, are horrible if we don't drain properly. And we need, so we need to think about infrastructure differently and design intersections quite a bit differently so they're safer. That means changing in terms of the distances we have to go to cross the street, putting in more pedestrian refuges, more uh, curb bulb outs as well so that pedestrians have a smaller distance to walk. We also have to think about pedways, and Minneapolis St. Paul is one of the largest collections of plus 15s in the world. But the problem with the plus 15 system is that you really rob the street life by putting everything at plus 15. And the danger you do that is that the, ped the pedways can accelerate the wind, so you end up taking what is a, a bad problem, which is about taking street life and putting it up 15 feet, and you can exasperate it and make it worse by actually amplifying the wind through pedways at the ground level. So you've st robbed street life and you take away uh, and you amplify the wind, which makes for a much more uncomfortable environment for pedestrians. So these things kind of compound a problem. This kind of slide shows you kind of a, a collage of all the different ideas that you can do in terms of high design roofs to mitigate uh, out the wind, heating shelters, uh, how you use canopies, towers, designs, uh, podium, deciduous trees, and all these different, or coniferous trees, all these different things you can do uh, to, to make for a much more successful public space and public realm in wintertime. That means also thinking about the pedestrians and what's really critical is too many streets, as I've walked around places in Minnesota, too many places have not provided adequate protection for pe uh, pedestrians. It's not just also about amplify, you know, redirecting the wind away from pedestrians. It's also providing uh, protection from people in terms of uh, icicles falling and rain coming down. We need to provide those protections. That also means thinking about bus shelters differently. How can they be warmer and more interesting? Building height and placement so that we're not unduly impacting other properties by having shadow impacts in wintertime and being very deliberate about where we put the public spaces in the building for the four seasons. Roofs are really critical. It was shocking to me when I went to, I guess maybe not shocking to me, when I walked around the MIT campus a couple of years ago and I saw a, a very handsome Frank Gehry building. And of course, the architect comes in, designs this you know, interesting building on the MIT campus, but six of the eight entrances to the building, it was February, six of the eight entrances to the Frank Gehry building on the MIT campus were closed because Frank Gary didn't think at all about snow and ice in Boston. And it, to me, it's shocking that in Boston and Cambridge that somebody would ever think about how is this building going to perform in wintertime? Well, Frank Gary didn't adequately think about that. And as a result, they had a horrible problem with falling snow and ice. Uh, and so it wasn't safe. So six of eight entrances has to, has to be closed. Too often, we don't think about uh, roofs and how they're, how they're kind of mitigating the snow and ice and, and again, creating a much more pedestrian-friendly environment. If people have to worry about uh, ice dripping off, uh, uh, liquid dripping off, and then, and then freezing when it hits the ground, or snow or ice falling, again, these are barriers that prevent having a successful pedestrian environment. Building setbacks and varying the, varying the, the setbacks so that we're again, Mitigating the we're mitigating the the wind, and we're also providing opportunities for people to have more sun traps are really critical. And 
terracing of buildings is an easy way to kind of mitigate the wind because when we terrace the building, we're giving more people opportunities for sun and we're providing more diffusion of wind before it hits the pedestrian level. Pocket space is really critical and this is really good uh, winter city design. So winter cities, if we can create these little pocket spaces where they get, they're oriented towards the south and that's where we put our cafes. That's where we kind of put our hyper, uh, uh, or hyper investment in uh, a really great, smart uh, public realm that's really thoughtful where we really want to get as much people watching as possible. The vehicle to do that is these little pocket spaces that embrace the sun. And the building massing and stepping is really critical. That means thinking about both uh, slender towers as much as possible and getting away from big slab designs. So that means we want as much as possible we want to really discourage buildings that are more than 7,500 square foot floor plates unless they've adequately thought about how they're going to mitigate the wind. And building design, again, I talked about use of wood, but you see the warmth that's used when you use wood as a material uh, and you use color and you use glazing in a way that's winter, winter city centric. And really, the outcome we want to get to in a lot of this is about creating the light for pedestrians. That means the, the shelter, that means the can, uh, canvas canopies and colonnades and creating in public spaces, always think about the production and enhancement of the pedestrian realm. Building entrances, so embracing uh, glass panels, again, to add some interest and to also think about the entrances of the building, how comfortable are they in inviting and also thinking about um, the indoor and outdoor relationships. Are we putting enough glazing at ground floor or is there way too much solid material at ground floor? And what's so important, I always say to our clients, if you only have $100 to spend on your facade, spend 85 of those $100 on the first 30 feet of the building because that's the most critical, third, that's the most critical part of the building in terms of the urban design. And if you can nail that first 30 feet, you're gonna have a much more successful <laughs> a much more aesthetically pleasing one. And you, you need to focus on having a lot of glazing. Uh, the majority of that 30 feet needs to have a lot of glazing in it so that you have way more transparency and more, way more of a connectivity between what's happening inside the building and the, and the public realm to create those people watching opportunities and create more, uh, more interest. Again, aesthetics is really critical and adequately thinking about this, not just in the summertime, but in the wintertime. And street furniture, too often we think about street furniture and we think about it as though every day is July 1st and it's green and it's really charming and warm outside. And what we don't think about is how does the street furniture perform when there's two feet of snow on the ground? Does the street furniture sit a little higher up so your feet can dangle down a little bit in the summer, but in wintertime your feet are sitting on snow that's kind of packed down a little bit? Are we thinking about that? Are we also thinking about how drainage works when we've got snow and ice that might accumulate on these benches? So as much as possible using wooden benches um, because of how they perform and using slats in the wooden benches so we get proper drainage. If we don't think about these things, then they're not going to be used for all four seasons. And also having boulevard trees are really critical. Boulevard trees are really critical because it A, provides us a place to put snow, two, it provides a buffer from the pedestrian from the vehicle realm, which is really critical because too often we don't provide boulevards. When a bus goes by or a car goes by, mm -hmm. pedestrians are constantly getting splashed with that ugly, brown, dirty water. And so if we don't provide boulevards in, with trees in them, then we've got no place to put the snow. And when we get melt, um, we're going to be constantly splashing pedestrians. And again, it's yet another reason why we are another barrier to walking and being a successful pedestrian environment, which is so critical uh, if we're going to have a successful TOD. Transit shelters and thinking about them is important, adequate, and, and so critical. And wayfinding, we think about wayfinding, we put up signs, we don't think about the performance of those signs for all four seasons. We need to think about how we're using light and wayfinding, and we can have fun with uh, light. We can think about light as uh, something that could be used whimsical in a fun way, and we can use light in such a way that it can add way more interest in terms of wayfinding, and it can actually be seen 
for the six months of the year where it's disproportionately dark. We can also use shelters and warming huts in our public spaces and have a little fun with them, architectural competitions for them, and snow fences as well so that we're, we're stopping the wind and, and the snow pilot. And then the residential buildings, coming up with design guidelines for them that are more inviting in wintertime. And the parks and plazas and interfaces them, are we thinking about what we're going to do with the blank spaces? And every city has got blank spaces, whether it's uh, a tired retail space where there's a, a long standing for lease sign, where there's a parking lot there that's underutilized after, after business hours. Uh, are we thinking about how do we animate those spaces so that, they're, so that something's happening there, so that they're safer, more comfortable to be in for all four seasons? On site layout and planning, one of the things I wanted to talk about is um, it's so critical to lay out um, buildings and when we do design of park spaces and our public realms to be thinking about the wind and sun and when we start thinking about a normal kind of short process we usually start with talking about what are the constraints and then we get into the opportunities but one of the constraints we sure we have to be thinking of is what is happening in the space with the wind and what's happening in the space with the sun and it's incumbent on us as, as planners and people and, and designers and engineers to be thinking about these things and the planting of vegetation that can be used so that we're, um, so that we're putting berms where they can add uh, comfort for pedestrians as well. And in other infrastructure such as uh, seating for people and fire protection and recreation opportunities. One of the things that was really interesting when you go to places like Oslo and Helsinki is that on their light rail lines, uh, it's not uncommon for people to bring their fat bikes and to bring their cross-country skis onto the LRTs. So are we actually thinking about stations and are we thinking about the LRT cars and even including places where we can put fat, uh, like bigger bikes like fat bikes or put uh, cross-country skis? And in the, some of the LRT cars I saw, um, they actually had places to put your cross-country skis on the in, inside the LRT car. I've not seen that done anywhere else in North America. But again, Scandinavians certainly love their uh, cross country scheme. Public art is, again, such an opportunity to do something whimsical and fun. And too often, our public art that we procure is done as though every day is July and not every day is January, which gets back to my principal point, which is that if you can make something successful in January, it's, it's absolutely going to hit it out of the park in July. So if you can really design for January and make that very successful and make that vibrant and make that a great TUD, then we would know it will do exceedingly well in July because it requires no effort to get people in Minnesota to go outside in July, but it requires a lot more thoughtfulness to get them to go outside in January. That means the kind of shelters and structures we're using, how we're reusing snow. Uh, it was interesting for me in Scandinavian cities or in Quebec City that rather than clear all the snow out of a public space or public square and then uh, simply bring it to a snow dump facility, the city workers take the snow, they pile it up, and then they mash it up and they encourage kids to make impromptu snow slides and little mazes and labyrinths out of snow. They give them little um, uh, they give them little paint that they can use to sometimes paint on the, on the snow. And they think a lot about how kids use snow. And then they come every couple of days and they mash up the snow again so it's, it's uh, more malleable and not as hard. So rather than get rid of the snow, they actually keep it and turn it into an asset that can be used for kids sometimes. And this is the uh, new convention center in Oslo. And they actually designed the roof not just as a, a roof that can be experienced where they have some gardens and a green roof in the summertime, but they thought about how the roof of this huge convention center overlooking can be used in wintertime as well, which is very fascinating. And this really comes down to just the principle of what are we doing to, uh, what are we, because you have to be so much more deliberate in wintertime. So what are we going to do to create all season buildings in, in Minnesota in spaces? What are we going to do to fill in those gaps, whether it's winter markets that can be used, whether it's dead space to make it more comfortable for pedestrians? What are we doing in terms of lighting and building design? Are we using ice hotels or restaurants or art? Are we encouraging a cafe culture that actually is year-round, or 
or is Minnesota going to keep doing what it typically does, which is you've got cafes from April to October, but you don't go year round. It was amazing to me to be in Paris on a day in January when it was minus 17 and people were sitting outside. Having, so this is set minus 17 Celsius is zero degrees Fahrenheit. And it was shocking to me in Paris, to be in Paris at zero degrees Fahrenheit and see people sitting outside. So what they had done was if you go to the tourist areas of Paris, every cafe will give you a blanket to put on your legs. You keep wearing your, your winter jacket. They'll, put a, they'll pull a plastic sheeting around the, the patio, and then they'll have uh, gas heaters. So it's the, the plastic sheeting blocks out the wind. The heating, uh, the gas warms it up a little bit, and then you've got a blanket over your leg. So you'll sit outside and have a meal in that and watch pedestrians go by and have an interaction with those pedestrians and still be able to do people watching. And it was shocking to me that a city like Paris um, has been doing this for a long time, and yet we in North America don't adequately think about uh, our cafes and sidewalks and how we can still utilize them for all 12 months and not just a few months of the year. We've become really kind of wimpy with this, and we need to change. We need a dress to be outside longer, but we also need to encourage our businesses to actually become more winter city-centric like uh, Paris has, because they didn't want to lose that opportunity to have tables on the street um, for wintertime. And incorporating fire and seating and making sure that we're putting fire pits in public places. It's interesting to go to Phoenix and Scottsdale, uh, which is obviously a, a place that many of us think of is very warm, see how often Phoenix and Scottsdale embrace fireplaces and outdoor seating. And because they're a desert, it cools off a lot in winter or in the summer or in the nighttime rather. And so they actually have a large number of fire pits in a lot of the public spaces and where, they, where people are going to gather. And so we should be doing far more of this in our winter city uh, locations like Minnesota and Canada. All this ultimately is about improving winter life and doing things that are going to get more people outside. And, and lastly, to close, is also thinking about how do we get for more happy kids? Because I'll tell you what, happy kids equals happy parents. If you make for a fun environment for kids to be outside in wintertime, and we think about how they use uh, public spaces in wintertime, then we're going to make it a lot more inviting for parents, and it's going to have a lot more uh, inclusion then. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's the presentation.